Good morning and welcome to Plymouth Congregational Church. We're an open and affirming congregation of the United Church of Christ and glad that you're here with us on this All Saints Day. Usually when we celebrate All Saints Day and Totenfest, Sunday doesn't land on November 1st, the Feast of All Saints, but this year it actually does. So um, it's nice that we can do that together. A special welcome to those of you who may be joining us for the first time. If you need to find the worship bulletin, it's at PlymouthUCC.org slash bulletin, and you'll be able to download it there, not only with our order of worship, but also with some announcements uh, as well. So today we, we celebrate Totenfest uh, on All Saints Day, which is a, a tradition that comes from our German evangelical and reformed tradition in the United Church of Christ when we offer uh, the names of all of those whom we have loved and lost this past year. Um, and if you have uh, the name of somebody that you'd still like to submit, please send it now to prayer at PlymouthUCC.org. Prayer is singular. Um, and usually what we do is we invite people to come forward in the sanctuary and speak the name of a loved one, but obviously we can't do that during the pandemic. So um, my colleagues, Carla and Jane Ann, will be reading the names. Um, Mark Haskinen will be ringing a chime after each name. And then I'll be lighting a candle for those whom we have loved and lost. And I need to share some very sad and difficult news with you. Um, yesterday morning, Linda and John Mahan's son, Wes, died at, at Poudre Valley Hospital. And so I hope that you will keep Linda and John and their whole family in your prayers um, during this really difficult time. Um, yesterday, we also had a, a really lovely drive-by Halloween experience for families and kids. And I wanted to say a special word of thanks to the Congregational Life and Christian Formation Boards um, and to our staff for that great Halloween drive through I came by for about an hour and it was lovely. Um, and I wanna say a special word of thanks to Trisha Medlock for being incredibly nimble and redesigning the entire thing last week. Um, we had been planning something different, but because of the new COVID numbers, we were not able to do that. So thank you. Um, I was going through my emails last night and um, I had 12 emails from a certain political candidate that I had already given to twice. <laughs> um, and yet they wanted more. Um, I'm sure you're probably getting those kinds of emails. And I wanted to reassure you that our stewardship board will never do that to you. You will never get 12 emails in a single day from our stewardship board. Um, However, um, if you have not yet pledged, this is a great time to do so um, because they will eventually be calling you um, if you haven't pledged and if you're a member of our congregation. Um, many thanks for the generosity and commitment of those who already have pledged, but in order to make our 2021 budget happen, we need to hear from the rest of you. Um, so you can pledge online at PlymouthUCC.org slash pledge. Um, and this coming week, if you haven't heard, there is an election happening. Um, if you have not voted, please do that today. Uh, and you can drop it off at, there are, I counted, there are 41 drop-off locations in Larimer County. Um, so please make sure to make that happen. And it's also a fraught time in our nation. Uh, you, you know how divided we seem to be. So if you need to ground yourself, if you need to center yourself, on election day, um, we're sponsoring um, labyrinth walks here on site uh, at Plymouth, and you can to do the whole thing coming from the parking lot outdoors, and um, there's sign up information so that we're social distanced in your bulletin. And then, you know, um, we've been hearing that we may not know the result of the national election on, on election night. Uh, and that may be causing some anxiety. So the day after the election on Wednesday at noon, we'll also be having um, a time when we can join together on Zoom 
um, for some prayer, maybe a little music, and um, to exchange thoughts and ideas. And again, there are details in your bulletin. And finally, we're getting into that time of year where there's a lot of <laughs> announcements and a lot of stuff going on. Um, the Visiting Scholar Program is coming up in two weeks, just under two weeks. Uh, Eric Elness, uh, a UCC minister, will be our Visiting Scholar, and some of you may have read his book, Gifts of the Dark Wood. You don't have to have read his book to, uh, to join with us on the day. And it's not just going to be a talking head with Eric, you know, expounding on his book. There's going to be a lot of breakout sessions on Zoom, so you'll get a chance to talk with other members of our congregation who are also attending the Visiting Scholar Lecture. Um, so please sign up. Uh, you can do that on our website at PlymouthUCC.org slash Visiting Scholar. Everything's on our website, isn't it? That's how things are at the moment. So I invite you to feel your feet firmly planted on the ground to take a few deep breaths, to sense God's presence in our midst, and to prepare to worship God together. Will you join me wherever you are and stand, if you are willing and able, for our call to worship. Glory be to you, O God, for the gift of life itself, for the days of our youth and the days of our maturity, for the days of light and days of shadow. God, we give you thanks for life. And on this day, we remember those whom we have loved and lost. We hold them close in memory, and we lift them up to you, the source of life, in whom we live and move and have our being. Amen.
This morning our church celebrates what we call Totenfest, a day we remember people who we loved and who have died. Now I'm sure you all have noticed that people don't like to talk about dying very much and they don't like to talk about grieving either. That's why I like this book. It looks like a kid's book, but it's really for everybody. It's written by Pat Schreiber and Chuck DeClin, and like the last book I shared, I had to cut it a little bit. So if you'd like to borrow it, just let me know. Tear Soup. There once was an old and somewhat wise woman who everyone called Grandy. She had just suffered a big loss in her life. This is the story of how Grandy faced her loss by setting out to make tear soup. She put on her apron because she knew it would get messy. And to make matters worse, grief always takes longer to cook than anyone wants it to. And then she started to cry. She sobbed. Grandy knew she had to make much of this part of the soup alone. So the old and somewhat wise woman reflected on her own special recipe. There were things Grandy never wanted to forget. These included the good times and the bad times, the silly times and the sad times. With her arms full of memories, Grandy made many trips to the kitchen. Her grandson, Chester, who just wanted his Grandy to feel happy again, hoped that his chocolate drops would help make her feel better. All of her neighbors came, but they just had words and it didn't help at all. Then her best friend Midge came. She said, I don't know what to say, but I'll be happy to listen. Come on, tell me about it while we make some bread to go along with your soup. Grandy kept attending worship, even though she was angry with God. Sometimes she yelled at God and asked why this happened. And sometimes she demanded to know where God was when she was feeling so alone. Still, Grandy trusted God, but she didn't understand. She sensed that people believed that if she really had faith, she would be spared deep sorrow, anger, and loneliness. Grandy kept reminding herself to be grateful for all the emotions that God had given her. One day, Grandy and Chester were going for a drive. Chester asked, Mom says you've been making tear soup. What does she mean? Well, tear soup is a way for you to sort through all the different types of feelings and memories you have when you have lost someone or something special. Remember when your baby brother died the night before he was born and your mom sat for days holding his blanket and weeping? She was making tear soup. You made tear soup yourself by acting out on your own disappointment when you shouted at Jason and wished that his brother would die too. Remember when Billy's dog died and he didn't want to play? Not feeling like having fun is one of the ingredients of tear soup too. And remember when Aunt Meg got divorced and they had to move? There was a lot of tear soup in that house. Some days when you're making tear soup, it's even hard to breathe. And then comes one of the very hardest days of making tear soup. It's when you decide it might be okay to eat something instead of soup all the time. The next morning as Grandy was cleaning up, Chester asked her if she was done making tear soup. Well, I don't think you ever actually finish. But for now, I can put it in the freezer and I'll know what's there when I need to take it out. So what else have you learned about making tear soup, Brandy? I've learned that grief, like a pot of soup, changes the longer it simmers and the more things you put into it. And most importantly, I've learned that there is something down deep within all of us ready to help us survive the things we think we can't survive. Grandy, you know so much, Chester said. What will I do after you die? Don't worry, 
I'll leave you my recipe for tear soup. Will you pray with me? Loving God, help us to remember that you are always deep down inside of us, and it's okay to be angry with you. Amen. Today's scripture comes from Paul's letter to the church in Rome, the 12th chapter, and rather than using our pulpit Bible this morning, I'm using uh, an old copy of the Revised Standard Version, and um, it belonged to a man named Roy Bramel, who you'll hear about in a minute, and Roy was the person I was paired with when I was a Stephen minister at First Congregational UCC in Boulder. Let love be genuine, hate what is evil, and hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection, outdo one another in showing honor. Never lag in zeal, be aglow with the spirit, serve the Lord. Rejoice in your hope, be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be conceited. Repay no one evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God within us, for the word of God among us, thanks, thanks be, be to, to God. God. I was really touched by the story that Trisha just read, in part because the family that I grew up in was very antiseptic about death. They were a pretty typical waspy family. They didn't like funerals. They preferred memorial services after the fact. They didn't talk about death, and, and I'm not really sure that they knew how to grieve and mourn. I knew something about that denial wasn't healthy. About 10 years, and, and I, I realized that most acutely when I was about 25 and my dad died suddenly. About 10 years later when I was a Stephen minister at First Congregational in Boulder, and uh, a first-year divinity student at ILIF, I was paired with Roy Bramel, a, a delightful, wise man in his 90s who had been the founding dean of the School of Education at the University of Connecticut 50 years earlier. And after Roy's death, I joined his family to, to visit his body at the mortuary. And as I saw his tall, thin body laid out in a coffin, it occurred to me that this was an empty shell, that Roy was no longer there. To me, it seemed that the body and the spirit were no longer connected. Later, the, the senior minister at Boulder, Bruce McKenzie, asked if I would like to help lead Roy's service, and I said that I'd be glad to. And as part of the service, Roy's two um, adult children collected some of the things that he had written over the years on a wide variety of topics like citizenship and education and duty and faith and so on. And they, they took turns reading these heartfelt pieces antiphonally, going back and forth. And in the process of hearing Roy's words, Roy's deepest thoughts, it seemed to bring Roy's presence back. 
even to revivify his spirit. And this was the first memorial service that I had been part of. And so I started crying in the chancel and I had no Kleenex. So that was a lesson learned. Never lead a memorial service or a funeral without a box of Kleenex in the chancel with you. So I was just there wiping tears with my new black robe. Roy's community of faith gathered to offer thanks to God for his life, to send him off prayerfully to remember him, to surround his family with a loving embrace. And as Paul says, to rejoice with those who rejoice, to weep with those who weep. Every one of us has a story. Whether we're homemakers or professors or deans or clergy or laborers or physicians or farmers or unemployed or business people, God knows our stories. And I think it's a natural sentiment that we want others to know our story. And I suspect that we all want to be remembered. That's an important function of a funeral or a memorial service. Or even those bronze plaques that are down in the gallery out toward our memorial garden, with, which contain the names of those who we have buried there. Sometimes when I go by those, those names in our gallery, I, I touch the bronze plaques because they're very tactile with raised letters, intentionally recalling the people who are named there. And I remember their stories and pray for them. You know, I have a, a strange affection for old cemeteries, especially those attached to congregational churches in New England. Looking at the artwork, which sometimes is fabulous, um, on these gravestones and reading the inscriptions makes me curious about the stories of the people they commemorate. One of my favorite cemeteries is at First Congregational Church in Kittery Point, Maine, where I served as a, a sabbatical interim minister during the summer between my second and third years of seminary. It is an exquisite location on the shore. It overlooks the harbor where the Piscataqua River passes and, and flows past Portsmouth, New Hampshire into the Atlantic Ocean. And I did some gravestone rubbings when I was there. And this one hangs above my desk in my office. It's the headstone of the Reverend Benjamin Stevens, who lived from 1721 to 1792. Stevens had a difficult ministry, a long ministry, because he was the pastor of that church during the American Revolution, walking the fine line between Tories and Patriots, and both were present in that congregation. And in 1776, the wealthiest family in the church, the Pepperell family, left Maine for England, never to return. And the church still uses the baptismal bowl and the communion silver that was given to them by the patriarch of that family, Sir William Pepperell. Everyone has a story. And here's what we know of Benjamin Stevens from his gravestone. In memory of the Reverend Benjamin Stevens, D.D., Doctor of Divinity, pastor of the First Church in Kittery, who departed this life in the joyful hope of a better, May ye 18th, 1791, in the 71st year of his age and the 41st of his ministry. In him, the gentleman, the scholar, the grave divine, the cheerful Christian, the affectionate, charitable, and laborious pastor, the faithful friend, and the tender parent were happily united. 
with that eulogy in stone, Stevens' story inspires me as a pastor 229 years later. When Stevens died, a minister from nearby Portsmouth preached at his funeral, and accounts say that Kittery Harbor was filled with boats from far and near, and that the crowd overflowed out of the meeting house. You know, this is one of the things that churches do. We help remember the people whom we've loved and, and who have died. We help provide a ritual that helps those in grief so that they have a, a place and an occasion to mourn with others, to receive love and support from friends and fellow parishioners, and to be the church for one another. And there's more. We offer prayers for those who have died. We commend their spirits into the arms of God, asking for them to be received into the company of the saints of light. Now, maybe if you're younger, or maybe if you grew up in a family like mine that didn't really want to deal with death, or if you've never had a brush with death yourself, it may not seem terribly important to you. But I'll tell you that when I die, I want somebody to pray for me. A funeral or a memorial service is more than just a celebration of life. It's an act of offering thanksgiving to God for the gift of life itself. God who has entrusted us with this gift. And as a church, we gather on this Sunday each year to name those dear loved ones who have died since this time last year. It is a poignant and a meaningful rite that we observe Year after year, we come to name their names, to recall these people and to recall their stories, to lift them up to God with a sense of love and remembrance and thanksgiving. You know, this is another reason why it's almost impossible to be a Christian without a community around you. Even when we have to wear face masks, even when we've used more hand gel in the past six months than we could imagine using in a lifetime, even when we are worshiping together via Vimeo, even when we can't give one another a physical hug, we're here for one another. Not only for ourselves, we're here as the hands and the feet, the eyes and the ears of Christ in the world today. Let love be genuine. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Extend hospitality to strangers. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. And live peaceably with all. Paul gives us a tall order. But I know this congregation, even in the midst of a pandemic even on the cusp of a divisive election. This congregation will be there for one another and for our community. I've seen you hold the light for one another for years. I've seen you hold the light for somebody who is experiencing the shadows of grief and despair. I've seen you do it for me and Jane Ann. 
I know what it feels like, and I'm grateful. God calls us to be there for one another. And you all do that with grace, with openness, with generosity of spirit. So let us enter a time of remembrance for the people we've loved and lost these past 12 months. Let us remember their stories and let us hold one another in our hearts. Amen. Sherry Betzel, mother of Brian Betzel. Robert M. Turner, brother-in-law of Mary Kay and Ron Graver. Ray Briscoe, longtime friends of Mary Kay and Ron Graver. Joan Lombardi, longtime friends of Mary Kay and Ron Graver. Mary Tollison Caldwell, mother of Claudia DeMarco. Mark Hill, son-in-law of Barb and Les Fraley. Alvin Schwent, longtime Plymouth member. Marguerite Oland, wife of Paul Oland, and Paul's brother-in-law. Morita, Morita Stuck, mother of Linda Mayhem, and Wesley Mayhem, son of Linda and John Mayhem. Gail Woods, mother of Khaki Woods. Glenn McLean, good friend of Tom and Jan McIntosh. Lynn, the mother of Mary and Ken Freeze's daughter-in-law. Eleanor Reeder, Karen Nestler's aunt. Lois Yenny, in remembrance by Kathy Hauser and Jen Mushi. Dan Conboy, the beloved father of Anne Worsland's nephew, Ryan. Jerry DeLapp, husband of Nancy DeLapp and longtime Plymouth member. Frank Gibson, husband of Plymouth member Maria Gibson and longtime Plymouth friend. Corinne Peck, longtime Plymouth member. Kurt 
Norskog, father of Alan Norskog. Steve Mosier, son of Mary Mosier. Tom Marsh, former Plymouth Sexton. Violet Gray, aunt of Sharon Smith. Carrie Ann Luscow. Lucas. Lucas, from Lee Lucas. Fred Connor, Sarah Lynn Laughlin's cousin. Larry Helberg and John Laut, friends of Phil Hafer. Eldon Miller, Ruth Long's uncle. Les Cor, Barry Long's longtime friend and fraternity brother. Jean Ellsworth, the aunt of Judy Clough. Ruby Theodore, sister of George Theodore. Pat Bowling Smith, friend and colleague of Karen Dawson. Joyce Wooley, cousin of Marty Marsh. Randolph Siegel, grandfather of Eric Siegel. Samuel Minata from Bob Calhoun. Noble Dean from Jan Ingert. Friends, that is a lovely ceremony and ritual, one that we do as a community. This was all a part of our community. And so we ask for your generous offering to maintain our community, to give generously for our time, talent, and treasure so we can continue to do this. Grieve and love and do as God called us to do to support each other in that community. Our worship continues with our musical offering. Thank you. 
I hope you'll join us at home as we celebrate communion, one of the two sacraments of, of our tradition. And whether you're using bread and wine or you're using uh, a piece of toast or a bagel and a cup of coffee, understand that that can be for you a symbol and a remembrance of the life and the love of Jesus that he shared with all of us and that he continues to share in our own time. Will you be with me in the spirit of prayer? Gracious and loving God, on this Sunday when we remember your saints, surround us with love and with light. Surround us with a warm embrace. Bless those who mourn. Help us as we weep with those who are weeping. And help us to bring light into the shadowy places in your world, places that need your light. Holy One, come by this place and infuse the common elements on the table in front of me and before all of those who are worshiping with us today. Infuse them with the, the spirit of the living Christ and help us to take that spirit out into your world. Amen. On the night before Jesus died, he gathered with his followers in an upper room. And as they sat down for a meal, Jesus took bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he offered it to his followers and said, this is my body broken for you. As often as you eat this bread, do it to remember me. Likewise, at the end of the meal, Jesus took wine and poured it. And as he did so, he said to his followers, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for many. As often as you drink from this cup, do it to remember me. Extending the ministry of Jesus into this time and this place, I offer you this bread and this cup. Let us partake together. Will you join me in our unison prayer of thanksgiving and dedication? We hunger, hunger O oh God, oh God, for, for more, more than, than bread. bread. We, we hunger, hunger for communion with others, for communion with, with you. May the, the gifts, gifts we have given, given serve, serve to create a passionate community, community where, where we and others need it, so, so all may know that, that we are not alone. alone. Amen. Amen. And will you join me as we gather together in the spirit of silent prayer? Glory be to you, O God, giver of life. We offer thanks for the lives and the stories of those who shaped us, who helped create a part of our story, who offered gifts to you and to your world, who continue to hold a special place in our hearts, a place they will never leave. And we give you thanks that we have entrusted them to your care. So that after their life in this place is finished, 
they rest in new relationship with you. Help us to continue to love them. Help us continue to love one another. Help us continue to be present with those who mourn. We give you thanks for this community of care that is a manifestation of your love for us and a manifestation of your relationship with us. Comfort those who mourn, Holy One. Many of us approach this week with a sense of trepidation and foreboding as we vote to elect political leaders. May we walk through the state of divisiveness with a renewed sense that we are in this together, that we are meant to be as Christ for one another, that we will continue to stand for justice and for wholeness and for peace, regardless of any election outcome. Help us assuage our fears and our anxieties by turning to our faith in you. We lift up this day all who are affected by the coronavirus in myriad ways. For those who have died, who deal with its residual effects, those who are newly diagnosed and in treatment, those whose employment is gone or in jeopardy. And we pray for the caregivers and the researchers working to ameliorate the suffering brought on by this pandemic. Give us all the will to act prudently and to stem the spread of this virus. Help us as we, as we mourn, as we live, and as we love, and help us to be faithful as together we offer the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy will be done, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Sharing the peace of Christ isn't just an act of saying good morning. It's not just how do you do. It is sharing the deep peace of Christ. The peace that is beyond our understanding and the peace that helps us as we mourn. The peace of Christ be with you.
Life is short, and we do not have much time to gladden the hearts of those who travel the way with us. So be swift to love. Make haste to be kind. And may the peace of Christ go with you this day and always. Amen.